What's up, guys? Happy Tuesday. Welcome back to another episode of Eat, Train, Prosper. Today is Brian and myself, and we are going to have a little discussion around finding the proverbial balance in pursuit of your physique, health, body composition goals, and how that will vary for each of us. Uh, Before we jump into this conversation, Brian and I have some updates. Brian, why don't you kick us off? As usual, I have the majority of the updates as it seems to go. Um, but we didn't get to do them last week. So last week we had Cass on. If you guys um, have yet to check that episode out, I highly recommend it. We spent over 100 minutes talking to Cass about muscle length research and the current state of things, especially um, in the presence of a lot of the stuff that Paul Carter has been putting out about how certain muscles may or may not respond to stretch mediated hypertrophy. Um, I definitely encourage you guys to go back and listen to that conversation with Cass from last week. And uh, with that out of the way, jumping into updates here. Um, So I talked two weeks ago about how my body weight was low in the off season, despite eating just this massive excess of food for the last few weeks. And the trend continues. We are uh, now five weeks to the day since my uh, photo shoot where I messed my foot up and where I kind of started eating mostly highly caloric palatable foods and for the most part this um indulgence season for me has not stopped and yet my body weight has stopped climbing in fact it has began going in the other direction so this is extremely interesting to me for a number of reasons um one because of just general metabolic adaptation theory uh, would be, I guess theory is probably the wrong word to use there because it's not, it's more than a theory. Um, But, you know, one of the components of metabolic adaptation is, is NEAT, uh, non-exercise activity thermogenesis that in theory goes up um, when you eat more calories and, and goes down as you diet. There's also this idea of People being more thrifty with their metabolism or less thrifty, um, where adaptations can occur larger or smaller as you go up and down. And so as an example, like somebody may diet on 500 calories less than their maintenance and be totally good there for a really long time, but on the other side, only be able to eat 500 calories over their maintenance or else they start gaining weight like a crazy person. Um, And then there's people on the opposite side of that spectrum, which I think I I am more on that side where I'm eating like 4,000 plus calories a day right now, uh, but I have to diet on 21, 2400, 21 to 2400 calories to get below 185. Um, The crazy part of this whole thing is like, it's not like I'm 195 or 200 pounds right now eating 4,000 calories. Literally, I just weighed in this morning at 187. And uh, five weeks ago, when I did my photo shoot, I was 185. So the amount, the disparity in the amount of calories that I can eat now compared to what I was eating when I was dieting is like almost 2,000 calories different. And yet the body weight is only two-ish pounds different. So um, <laughs> I'll let you jump in and then I have some thoughts on it. Do you have, do you have, do you have some, anything to say on this thus far? Yeah, so I mean, the, kind of the, the the term that I think you were searching for is the adaptive thermogenesis, yeah. and it's highly individual. There, and a, a good way to know how you may respond, um, I find it much easier to know how you're going to respond in like gaining phases, or if you're like, hey, if you need to feed yourself at like nineteen, or I shouldn't say like nineteen, like twenty two, twenty four, twenty five x body weight, or, or even up, I have a um, I have a client we had to do like 27 to finally get like weight moving on the back end you were probably going to have to pull calories uh quite not quite low but lower than you would probably expect because of that large uh adaptive thermogenesis there um i am really interested in i mean what you have right now like the situation you are in brian is literally the um what's the word i'm looking for it's like the it's the it's the perfect case scenario, right? You dieted, you got lean, and now you're on this. You're just you're living a super flexible lifestyle, but you are very close to what your low of the diet was. There hasn't been a large accumulation of um, um, fat post diet, which is fantastic. Um, 
That being said, I think we 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 hinted at this maybe our two or three episodes ago. Your lo- the longer you play the game really well, like the better you get at it, and the more that you can get away with. But if you're someone listening and you're like completing your first you know year of diet or not your year of diet, your first like season of dieting, or whatever, it's probably not going to be the case for you. So tread carefully as you go into it. Yeah, yeah. No, I totally agree with that. And and I'm more I'm just amazed that like like in past diets, I've purposefully tried to keep my knee up because I wanted to stay leaner after dieting. So I'm like, oh well if I'm gonna be eating all these calories, I at least have to keep getting, you know, fifteen thousand steps or, or something like that. But um, my case right now is that my foot's been injured for five weeks and I'm not doing steps. Like my last my average has been six, seven thousand and that's a lot of low intensity, just kind of hobbling around limping after the kids or whatever. Um, But of course, as I mentioned, I have picked up biking. So um, the thing, as we know with cardio, is that you don't really burn like that many calories. I mean, you burn more calories than you do weightlifting. But the amount of calories that that you burn in like a period of time doing cardio can be mitigated by eating like one piece of pizza. I mean, literally, I go out for a 40-minute bike ride and I burn you know, four to 500 calories, which is, yeah, like a piece and a half of pizza or something along those lines. So, so I don't really think of the fact that I'm biking right now as like the reason I'm staying leaner. Um, I more think it's related to just my body's internal processes revving up, um, significantly. So as examples of kind of what might be happening here, I, uh, since I've been eating more food, my sleep quality has gone down. Uh, I mentioned this when I was dieting that my sleep quality was going up. Um, My sleep quality is much poorer now. I'm waking up many more times throughout the night. As per typical off-season Brian, at 2 a.m. every night, I wake up just like hot and bothered no matter how cold the house is and I can't get comfortable for 30 minutes. Uh, My resting heart rate has gone up about 8 to 10 beats per minute every morning when I test it. My HRV is lower. Um... So anyways, those are those are all variables. And yes, what, what you got there, Aaron? What do you got to say? Are you waking up sweaty or just like uncomfortable? Hot, not sweating. Like there's not actual sweat on okay. me, but I am mm-hmm. certainly hot and I'm throwing the covers off of me type thing. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that is a, an indication of uh, adaptive thermogenesis going up, just yeah. being hotter at night sort of thing. Uh, the last question I, I have there, and I'll, and I'll let you get back to it. How, what is your proximity to from your final meal to bedtime? Is it? I've still been doing the same thing where I stop eating before six thirty, seven, and then go to bed at thirty. I, I don't ever eat past six thirty. Seven might be like the latest, latest, but usually it's five thirty or six. To be honest. Wow, that's yeah. impressive. And, and, and then I go to we, what? I was, it just I just ate before we came here at seven forty five. We'll record yeah. to like 9.15 and then I'm going to go home and eat again before I go to sleep. <laughs> yeah, I eat from or I consume calories from probably like 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. average most days. So something to test that you if you, if you have a glucometer or anything like that in the morning yeah, when don't. you are getting up, yeah. if it's high, it could be you could it could be like a piece, some fruit before bed it could help mitigate that. It mm. is something to explore like handful of berries, maybe a kiwi, something like that. Yeah. Um, so anyway, those are interesting and I think they can contribute to the idea of like the revving of the fire in my body and just like being more metabolically active with that, uh, adaptive thermogenesis going up. So, um, all of that's really interesting. Uh, part of me doesn't like this. Like, like I obviously enjoy eating all the food, but I don't enjoy like having shittier sleep quality and, um, having my HRV lower, like my HRV's dropped 10 points. My resting heart rate's gone up 10 points, um, all within the last few weeks. So anyways, just kind of also on the heels of a number of episodes ago, I was talking about how maybe I'm meant to be in this like smaller body or like eat less food or whatever. And so these are all kind of clues to the puzzle here. Um, I do have a DEXA scheduled my very first one. It's a shame that I didn't get it done and put it together, uh, at the end of the diet. But, um, at this point, I'm not so far above where I was at the diet. So um, it will be scheduled for August 10th, which uh, is going to be a day after this episode airs. And uh, the awkward thing about my DEXA is the only appointment available was at 1130 a.m. 
And so I know that what we want to do is we want to be consistent. Primarily, we want to be consistent with how we do them. And so the way to be most consistent is to do them right when you wake up, fasted, et cetera, et cetera. Now, here's my question for you. It's at 1130. I'm probably supposed to work out that day. What if every time I do DEXAs, I schedule them at around the same time and I work out beforehand and I have my whey and Gatorade and no other food. So it's always like the exact same thing each time. Um, do we think that that skews the data in an inconsistent manner or do we think that because it's doing it consistently each time that there's a variable of or that it decreases the variable potentially? I would I would err or I would side with the latter. Um, the just as long as you understand that and are consistent. One of the things that I will tell like my clients is like as long as you are accurate in sorry consistent in your inaccuracies, that's right. what we're looking for. You don't want to yeah. be inconsistent with your inaccuracies. So if it's always like, hey, I'm going to eat before my DEXA, I'm going to train before my DEXA, but I'm like that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to eat and train. I'm always going to have my like pre workout meal, which for you is like the whey and Gatorade sort of thing. I think that's fine. The potential that I could see is like if it's one day, it's after like a, a delt day and the yeah. next day it's after like a glute ham and quad day potentially. But, you know, we're kind of splitting hairs there. I think it's just trying to like piece it consistent. So what, what you don't want to what you want to avoid is going into it like super fasted and depleted one time and then going in like carbohydrate recompensated after like a, a pizza you know, free meal night or something like mm. that because that you will get gut contents, glycogen storage, which is going to bring water, which is all technically from a DEXA, can, DEXA scan perspective, lean body mass because it's mm -hmm. not fat mass. And that's how it's kind of just It's a three-factor like, model, I believe. Yeah. You have your, I believe the bones are, are considered like a separate thing, but then you have like lean tissue, which is everything but bones and fat yeah. mass. Yeah. No, I agree with that as well. So I'll just make notes of kind of like what I trained, what I ate the night before and what I consumed during the workout or something along those lines. Um, but anyway, I'm excited about that. And then it comes with an RMR test, but I need to do that at a different facility and it's a different day. Um, so I actually haven't scheduled that yet, but I think that would be relatively interesting just for like personal interest. Have you ever done it before? No. It's I did it when we were in, in Texas and it kind of sucked. It, you have this tube and you have to like breathe out of your mouth for like, I think it was like 20 minutes straight. Low key, it was kind of fucking hard because <laughs> they like put a pinch thing on your nose and you just yeah. have to like fucking huff and mouth breathe for 20 oh, minutes straight. Man. I was very uncomfortable. And then at the end of it, it was just like, oh yeah, your RMR is higher than you would expect. And you are one a 100% a carbohydrate burner. It, it, there's like a, some, some, numbers it runs to say like how much of like a fat burning to carbohydrate burning you were and I was like 100% on the carbohydrate side and it was like I did it like in May and I had started my diet at the end of March so I'd already been like five or six weeks into a calorie deficit that was going very swimmingly so I'm like all right I don't know how much I really buy into this because it wasn't like 85 for 15 it was 100% and zero. <laughs> right. So well, nobody's like that. that nobody's that extreme, right? <laughs> yeah. That's like the yeah. hip abduction is zero glutes. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So that it, it's interesting for sure. Uh, yeah, for way. sure. For sure. All right. Um, jump into your update real quick. I must fill my water bottle up. I'm parched. So I will be back in like 30 seconds. <laughs> You're on mute. I just muted my, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, my biggest update that I, I have two. I'll save the first one for when Brian gets back. So I'm in a calorie deficit right now. It is about week 10. Um, calories are not, it's a slow deficit, so it has been pretty interesting. But something that I'm always very interested in is progressing training during calorie deficits. It becomes more important to time things more appropriately because what you may find, especially training larger muscle groups, like today was quads, hams, and glutes, I ended up running some errands and stuff before I went to the gym and it had ended up being like almost three hours after my pre-workout meal to my like training. And I was getting like a little nauseous and like very kind of like just dizzy and, and things like that. But I'm very, very connected to like the log book and especially on this day, which has the hack squat. And I'm like, I want to progress that. And I'm like giving it my all. And what's really 
like wild to me is like I'm now on week 10, 11 of, of lower calories and then pushing these heavy sets and still progressing. It, it's I'm waiting for like when can I realistically not continue to progress this, but I haven't really found it yet. Uh, so that was one thing that was really interesting is just with the deficits, things you can still progress training for a pretty damn good while, which is really, really cool. You just want to make sure that you're doing, you're, you're setting yourself up for success with your meal timing in those sorts of things because it matters more when you are in a lower energy availability environment as opposed to the opposite. Yeah, so quick comment on this. Um, Jordan Lips and I have talked about this a number of times on when I've been on with him, but this idea of like, especially when you have new movements or new machines that you haven't used before, that these neural adaptations, they happen for so many weeks in a row that it's not often even that you just hit a wall and can't progress anymore. It's almost more likely that mentally you just have so much anxiety going into your session at the idea of having to progress that you kind of don't or you have to deload or you take a step back and kind of reload and build back up or like any number of other kind of psychological ramifications that result in you not progressing versus physically you being unable to continue to progress. And it's, it's like a subtle difference because for sure there's the psychological variables affect your physical output. Um, but it's just kind of an, an interesting thing that I thought of as you were speaking. Yeah, definitely. And this, I mean, I really only get it with, so it's twofold. I care about the hack squat so much because the, my quads are like a, a lagging body part. I want them to grow. I know it's it's like a necessary evil sort of thing. Um, and it's like a big, it's like a gut check movement. You know what I mean? So so I, I, I do have like a like a psychological connection, or I guess I should say like an emotional connection to really trying to beat that week over week, um, especially with the current training, because it's not, it is RIR based, but like my fourth set, it's a set of 10. And I'm like, okay, well, last week I did 11 with 160 kilos. Like I want to, I'm going to increase weight. I want to hit 10 reps again, you know? So I, I honestly, I, I added another five kilos and I only got eight reps, but I also progressed sets two and three, which that's adding fatigue going into that top set sort of thing. Um, but it is like really, uh, just a, it, it's a very interesting situation there. Um, but what I wanted to talk about first before when, when you kind of ran to get some water today was like the day where like my quads firing in like a squat, I shouldn't say the firing because of course they're firing the weights moving like the the connection the mental connection there the the amount the the my ability to like contract and produce force through the quads and feel really strong in that position like finally came full circle like today at fucking 34 years old after <laughs> trying for like years and years but like full range of motion and I could like feel the power coming out of my quads like driving with my knees out over my toes and like the it felt really heavy but the weight was still moving and I had an incredible stimulus. Like by set three, my quads were like super pumped and I was like, this is it. This is like what I've been searching for for however many fucking years and I've like finally figured it out today. Um, so it was a really, really cool feeling uh, to finally get there with a muscle that I wanted, I've wanted to get there with for so long. Very cool. No, I love that so much. Do you have your toes slightly turned out? Are they straight forward? What's the width of your feet? The feet are decently narrow. Like I would say a little bit closer in than, than hip distance with a very slight, maybe 10 degree toe cool. out. That's about that, how I do this as well. And that just allows me to get the biggest range of motion without stretching my adductors too much. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I can, f a big part of it is I can still drive really forcefully, like through my full foot with my, through that heel too. Um, and that's kind of like my default setting there where I feel cool. like really powerful. Um, and my joints line up really, really well, full range of motion. It, it feels really good there. Very cool. Um, anything else to say on the, the updates? 
no, I need to start writing them down throughout the week because every yeah, Tuesday yeah. night when I'm like, oh, I'm gonna, what, what did I do this week? Is there anything new? I can really only remember stuff from Tuesday. Um, I have some, I have really cool things going on uh, behind the scenes, but I'm just keeping them under wraps until they are pretty much we're going to like release. Uh, but more on that in the coming weeks, I should say. Sweet, sweet. All right, I'll finish up with a couple quick updates here. Uh, Paragon had our second in-person seminar this past weekend. Uh, it was here in Boulder, which was super cool because uh, I was basically just gone all day Saturday, but I still was able to kind of be like a, a semi-present parent. And I got to show all these people kind of some of my hood and and everybody really liked it. So, so Lori was like a huge fan of the time she spent in Boulder. Um, we did a full day of like lifting and instructional education, nutrition kind of Q&A stuff, just um, kind of bonding with the group and having a whole lot of discussions around things that people wanted to learn about. And then uh, there was also two, well, there was one big event the following day. Uh, everybody went on a hike, like it's really amazing four mile hike up in the mountains, which I couldn't do because of my foot, unfortunately. But uh, we had a pre hike coffee. So I biked uh, from my house to the coffee shop, which was super cool that I was able to do that since it's in Boulder. And uh, had coffee with everyone, got to connect again after the day, see how everyone's feeling, their, their thoughts on the seminar, and everyone just was, was so excited about it, which obviously makes us feel great and feels like we're providing value, which is, of course, a great feeling. Um, and uh, my foot is continuing to get better, so I bought at the request of the – oh, did I – I actually haven't even updated this, but I went to see an orthopedic surgeon last week. Uh, about my foot just to get the official diagnosis and uh, the prognosis and so as it as expected it turns out that I did completely rupture tear my plantar fascia it was the a full tear of the medial plantar fascia which is going to be the one on the inside of the foot which is makes sense because that's where it hurts and then a partial tear of the middle plantar fascia um, but the lateral one on the outside of the foot is completely fine. So um, that is why I was able to walk on the outside of my foot with no pain for the last four weeks. Um, my left knee has been bumming since trying to hobble around for the last five weeks. It's really targeted my left knee in some really gnarly ways. And uh, I think that it's brought to the surface an old CrossFit injury that I had to my left knee. I remember one day where where there was a wad of uh, three rep max back squat superset with a hundred meters dead sprint, and uh, and and I remember my knee just not doing well for a couple weeks after that, and then it kind of went away, and I didn't think about it much. But it's the exact same spot and the same knee that 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 was you know six years ago, so um, I got the orthopedic surgeon to write me up a MRI. And I have that scheduled for t today, today actually. Um, so I'm going to go in and get my left knee MRI. My guess would be at this point that it's probably a meniscus, especially based on the symptoms of like, hey, it kind of comes and goes. Like sometimes like some things can aggravate it and make it worse and and that sort of thing. So, so if it is meniscus, then hopefully they can just go in and scope that thing. And it's a matter of like two or three weeks and I'm back to life as normal. Um, but it has really been bothering me since I injured my foot. And uh, especially on knee flexion, leg curls. So it's not terrible on like RDLs and stuff like that. But um, things where I'm bringing my heel to my butt, it like, I feel it like rolling over something as I'm, as I'm going through knee flexion, right? In like the middle range of the movement, there's like this rolling popping thing that's occurring. And so that is kind of part of also why I think it's, it's meniscus based. But um my foot has been much better. I just started rehab yesterday with uh, my Mobo board, M-O-B-O, -O, and it's kind of this like wobbly board that you put one foot on and try to balance and do these kind of foot control mechanisms on it. Um, and so I was able to start that yesterday, which was great. And I feel like I am uh, at least on the mend as far as that goes. The orthopedic surgeon said, probably four to eight weeks of like me dedicated using the Mobo board. And he thinks I can probably get back to 99.5% of where I was prior. So that's fantastic. Except for like the potential knee surgery as well. But I mean, <laughs> yeah, when it yeah. comes to knee surgeries, that's about like as 
good as it gets sort of thing, which I was yeah. always really surprised about how quickly people would return from them. Yeah. I mean, we'll see. If it is just an arthroscopic thing on meniscus, then that's one thing. If it's something else, then, then who knows? Um, okay, cool. Well, we can jump into the episode, and then my last update was just going to be some sentiments I have that kind of feed into this. So our, our topic is about like finding balance in training, right? And so this thought that's been pervasive in my mind for now a couple months, maybe since the end of my diet, as I kind of started to dwindle in like psychological arousal before sessions and things like that. I keep having this like, like life keeps throwing this idea of minimalist training at me. And uh, Dave and Abel and I did an episode uh, like a number of months ago where we talked about like, what would minimalist training look like for us? If, if we were to design like a, a training program that maybe is like just above what would be maintenance. Like you think maybe you can make a little bit of progress, but it's like, as to use an Israel term, like minimum effective volume across just like the body, you know, and what would that, that minimalist dose be? And so my thought has always been that I keep, anytime I find myself in these psychological states throughout my history of, of training, I've always resorted to a, uh, a full body split that essentially trains the full body every two to three days. So you might think like a Monday, Thursday, Sunday, Wednesday, Saturday type thing. So you get like five sessions in over two weeks or something along those lines. And in the past, it has always been the basic movements that are, you know, relatively barbell specific because I've been in CrossFit gyms where it's like one day you'll like squat, bench press, bend over row. And then another day you'll hip hinge, overhead press or dip and uh, vertical pull. So like a pull up of some sort. But on the episode with Dave and Abel, I kind of thought about the same idea but what if instead of it being barbell specific, you could just choose any movement you want that fits that movement pattern? So you have your squat, your hor your chest press type movement, and your row type movement. But maybe that can be a pendulum, a T-bar row, and a cable chest press. And then alternatively, maybe it can be like an RDL. On the other day, it can be like an RDL, uh an incline dumbbell anterior delt press and a uh, iliac lat pull down. So something along those lines. And I don't know why I just like in the last few months, my mind has just kept kind of creeping back to like, Hey, maybe I should do this. Maybe I should do this. And, and I keep like justifying it as, okay, it's an experiment and maybe it'll be like cool to see if I can, a, do I gain anything? Is it just maintenance or, on the reverse, maybe I actually end up sliding backwards and I realize that this isn't enough for me and that uh, at this stage of my training, I have to do more if I want to continue progressing. But but I'm doing a lot right now. I'm training you know, five days a week and my sessions are like an hour and a half each. So I'm putting in seven and a half hours of training each week. And it would be kind of cool for me to try this minimalist training, put in an hour and a half, two to three times a week and if I find out that I don't actually go backwards or if I can even continue to make slight progress, at this stage of my training, like any progress is good progress. So if I can do that with less than half of the amount of training commitment, um, that would be really cool too. And so I think that fits really well into beginning this conversation around balance and how finding the right dose of training so that you can progress towards your goals without doing so much that you're, I mean, I guess it would be called junk volume. Like if I do find out that I can progress on half of what I'm doing, then in theory, I've been doing junk volume unnecessarily. So um, anyways, it's an interesting thought on my brain and, and curious what your thoughts are as we head into this discussion. Yeah. So the first one that I would, my first thought was, well, this is a fantastic time because we're going to have the DEXA and then you can do it for a period of however long. We get another DEXA and see what happens mm. with, you know, lean body mass ultimately. Mm -hmm. um, the next thing to me is like, well, how are you defining success, right? Or, or pro pro progress, I should say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it progress in terms of hypertrophy, lean muscle mass carried? Is it progress in terms of strength? That's like mm -hmm. one of those things. And, and I've been having this conversation much more with clients where, where I'm asking them like, well, how are you defining progress? Is it strength? 
based type things or is it physique and like lean muscle mass because they are similar but not one in the same sort of thing. Um, so I think that would be the first thing is really like how do you define that progress? Yeah. Because I know to, to me what it is, it's how much muscle mass I'm carrying. Yeah, but that's like such a slow caterpillar pace, even slower than it's like a injured caterpillar pace. Um, so yeah, you're totally right. And the fact is that because I would be decreasing my training volume and frequency, the chances of my strength adaptations going up quicker is actually probably a reality. So what would happen as I do this is I would gain strength really quickly in the first few months just because uh, my fitness fatigue spectrum is shifted more toward fitness and, and less toward fatigue. Whether that correlates to more muscle is anyone's guess. I mean, the, tr the, the truth of the matter is that if you're a natural 25 years into training and you're continuing to get stronger over time, that is probably the best proxy that we have for gaining muscle, but man, does it become ambiguous when your strength continues to go up because you're dropping volume and we know that volume is correlated to, to increase muscle. It just, it becomes this really confusing piece of, uh, of data and maybe you're a hundred percent spot on that if I were to do this, it's like, Hey, here's my DEXA at 190 pounds body weight or whatever it is before doing this training and then I do this training for six months or whatever period of time it is and I go back and do a DEXA at hopefully the same body weight and and see at that point. So um, I don't know how realistic all of that exactly is that my body weight stays the same for a six month period of training, but um, it is definitely an interesting idea. Yeah, uh, it. what's really funny and, and Brian, you and I have of course talked, to, talked about this offline, but I'm currently in, in the in, in the depths of like a a, hyper, a very dry hypertrophy book, and it's like the deeper that I go, the the it's like how how much I realize how little I know and how concrete even what the like experts say in terms of like it's it's really shaky concrete among experts looking at the same studies sort of thing, um, because yeah, like what you said is over a long enough history, like as you get stronger, it would make sense that you have more muscle. But I can tell you right now, like I'm, I'm considerably weaker than I was when I was like 19. But my mm -hmm. physique is leaps and bounds better than it was when I was 19. Even though from a weight standpoint, we were within the same seven, eight, nine, ten 10 pounds. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it does get ambiguous once you get out of those like first couple years, I think of, of training in that like beginner to early intermediate stage for sure yeah yeah like even looking at the pendulum like i don't even think i could say like if my pendulum ends up 15 pounds heavier at the end of this minimalist training period than it is now i don't think i could even say like that for sure means that i gain muscle in my quads at all it's just i yeah i think there's there's something to you know like subjectively doing more sets, not necessarily getting stronger, just creating that tension in the muscle over time. I mean, it's, it's just, yeah, it's very ambiguous. So yeah. Um, anyway, yeah. So this is my, this is how I think of balance, obviously. Like there's so many components to balance, but the first place my brain goes always is training. Like how do I find training balance in the, the, the rest of my life? Um, and, and so frequency becomes a piece of that and like time commitment overall and, uh, how much psychological effort or energy you're putting into each, uh, the, the, the commencement of each training session, how much anxiety it causes, things like that. So, so when you think about balance, what are the components that kind of go into your definition of it? Yeah. So I think it's great to start on the training side. Like, like you said, the interesting thing with, with training and how it works is when you are newer to it. You, ne you need to, or not need, but you can give it the least amount of effort and your progress is like the, the biggest and best. So it's like a very kind of flipped sort of um, situation where it's like you don't really have to take training like that seriously or, or until you realize it's something that you really want to add more into your life. Because in the beginning, like as a beginner, just training three times per week and doing your some traditional lifts and challenging yourself like you're 
going to make really good progress. And then by the time you decide that like, hey, I really want to become like a, a solid intermediate to advanced type person, like it's already been a while of you're bought in, like you, you've already achieved like escape velocity of that. It's a lot more fun. Um, it's more like it's, it's a hobby esque type thing. So I think in terms of balance and then from there, you really have to decide it's either something that you want to take. You want less balance in your life and it's going to take up a, a larger part. You make faster progress and then you reach a point where it's as a natural, it's, it's slow regardless. You're in this for 8, 10, 12, 15, 20 or like Brian, what are you, 24 right now? Years. Yep. So uh, yeah. I mean, that's my take of the balance there on the training side. Yeah. No, I agree with that. And I think almost unconsciously, I started finding maybe some balance in implementing this biking into my routine that I've been doing, where I've been doing this, you know, three or four times a week. And it's a mix of like sprint sessions that might just be six or seven minutes of as hard as I can go with like longer drawn out, like 40 minute sessions with some hill climbs and stuff like that. Um, I don't too often go over 40 minutes though I have. Um, but I like really enjoy it. And I think one of the coolest parts about it is that I'm almost a beginner not in the sense that, hey, I've never biked before, I'm a noob, but like in the sense that my aerobic system, my cardiovascular system is so undeveloped that I'm getting newbie gains and that's been so, so, so fun. And maybe that's been part of why my brain has been meandering toward these lower frequencies for weightlifting because I'm so much enjoying these newbie gains that I'm getting from biking. But inevitably, if I'm really like tying my horse to hey, these newbie gains are so fun. Well, they're about to run out. Like my, my biking newbie gains are, are, are pretty quickly um, dissipating. So I, uh, like I can see that in the improvement in the courses that I run. I have a 10 mile course and you know initially it was like PR by five minutes, then it was three minutes, then it was two minutes and then it was a minute and a half. So like already these PRs are dwindling and I'm having to ride for 41 and a half minutes to get a PR, you know? Um, so... So yeah, it's balance can come in many forms for me because I put such a predominant importance on my training, regardless of what type of training it is. It's, it's interesting that, that my, my balance has come by just implementing a different form of training into my life. One where I can feel uh, success again in, in a, in a rapid way. Yeah, that, that definitely makes sense. I think when I initially was thinking about it, of course, by our own, our own natures, right? I am primarily a nutrition coach and you're primarily like a, a, a hypertrophy coach, strength and conditioning kind of coach. Um, I was thinking more along from like the diet side of things mm -hmm. and just seeing like what I see with a lot of like clientele or having these conversations. And I think you kind of come at it into this from two aspects. You come in it as the, you know, maybe high school athlete, maybe co collegiate athlete or someone like a, like that was like us a crossfit athletes like post college where it it was everything and we the balance was by us kind of pulling back and realizing that some of the things we were doing was pretty superfluous right like training 7 days per week um doing like all these really unnecessary things so like by pulling back some of that balance we like reduced stressors those sorts of things and it was actually like a needle mover forward or you have the complete opposite side of the spectrum where someone is maybe just doesn't, there is no good maybe role models in their life for a healthy lifestyle sort of thing. And everything is coming from a very, very like negative or super flexible, just tons of alcohol. You know, life is a planned hedonistic deviation sort of thing. And then they're trying to find that balance like in the middle. And that is where I kind of was, my initial thoughts were. And the reason there is, how I will explain it to clients coming in is like people think they go from like far left, let's call left, like for all intents and purposes, like the unhealthy side. And then the pendulum swings and just stops in the middle. And they're like, oh, well, I, I want to get to this health point, but I want to make sure that I'm still have flexibility in my life. I can still go on dates and have beers and all these things. But then they're like discouraged at their rate of progress without realizing that for most things, right, using this pendulum analogy, we need to swing far to the opposite side and kind of mm -hmm. not find an extreme, but see what that's like before you can actually find that balance. 
Um, and that's kind of the conversation I wanted to have because I know so many people are out there thinking around, I want to make these improvements, but I don't want to become like one of those psycho people or what happens mm-hmm. if I need to like track my food at a restaurant or all these things. And it's all relative to your rate of progress and how mm-hmm. important it is to your life. So yeah. that's like the conversation that I wanted to get rolling there. Anything uh, on that, Brian? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, that's a great point. And I think there there are certainly degrees to how ambitious you need to get with uh, with letting that pendulum swing to one side. And so the, the components that might affect the degree at which would be uh, how close you are to that goal. So your your experience overall, right? Like... If somebody is with 20 years experience, they're going to have to optimize things much more to see the needle move uh, towards that goal. Whereas when you look at me and biking, like I could probably sleep like shit, eat like shit and everything, but I would still see adaptations and success in biking because the adaptation is so new to me. Um, But when we're talking about weight training or like increasing my pendulum or something like that, if I have shitty sleep, and shitty nutrition and shitty lifestyle decisions, then that probably goes the other direction. Um, so, so there's certainly varying degrees to that based on what you're trying to achieve and how close you are to that goal. Um, and then also, I think it's similarly related. I don't even know if you can call this like a different topic, but I keep thinking, I'm thinking about like, you know, somebody on a diet that's cutting and how mm-hmm. in the beginning- the best scenario. You yeah, yeah, you have so much more freedom- in the beginning of a diet to flexibly eat, um, play a little bit of Tetris if that's your thing. And then as you get closer to the end goal of that diet, uh, the superfluous, superfluous, man, neither of us can ever say that word, but those foods, they got to go, man. You got to, you got to just keep in the most critical ingredients. And so the example I always use is, you know, my plate of food, in uh, an off season phase might be, you know, I'm having two burgers that are 85, 15 with cheese on them and a bun and a side of potatoes. Maybe they have some cheese on them and there's like broccoli with like some olive oil and stuff. So, so it's very, very dense food with, with all the, the palatable fats added to, to make the food even more enjoyable. And then as you go through the diet, it's like, okay, the first thing that goes is the cheese, but you can keep the bun and whatever and the olive oil. Then you're like, oh, well, now the cheese is gone. I'm going to have to, I'm still not making, I'm not making progress. So I'm going to have to cut the bun out. Okay, now I got to cut the olive oil off the broccoli. And by the end of the diet, you're left with two burger patties. They're no longer 85.15. They're like 93.7. So you have like two 93.7 burger patties. You have some veggies with nothing on them except some salt and pepper. And you have uh, you have some potatoes also dry with nothing on them except salt and pepper. So so this meal that was like almost restaurant quality in the beginning has now become just like this depressing thing that you don't even feel full from at the end, and it doesn't even taste good. <laughs> so one thing that I will say on the back of that though is I find that your taste buds shift over yes. a diet. Yeah. Yeah, like yeah. I've had clients who, who who have like kind of jokingly messaged that I've ruined drinking for them because like through our diet, they're like, hey, I really want to give this my all. Like I'm not going to drink alcohol for like six months or whatever. And then we like we get there, we achieve it and they layer it back in and they're like, alcohol is not making me nearly as happy as it used to. Like I am not enjoying that IPA like I used to. And I'm like, yeah, your taste buds will change. Like at the end of a diet, like fruit literally yes. tastes like candy. yes it is insane yeah. um and that's one of those things where i find that people who try and keep the tetris in iifym too long into the diet it it almost starts working against you because you like sh- the fruit isn't sweet enough you need that like real sweetness whereas opposed to like when you just go all in and you're like hey i'm not gonna have it that fruit like goes through the roof and it's like palatability and what it does, like what it, those boxes it checks for you sort of thing. Yeah. If you have dessert, like if you like fit in macro Tetris and suddenly you have like, I don't know, a cannoli or a piece, a bite of a chocolate eclair or just like something. And you're like a hundred calories of this. 
well, then the last thing you want is fruit because the fruit doesn't taste good after that, you know, but, but if you finish that super bland meal that I just referenced and then you're like, man, I'm so glad I have a hundred calories left for seven, for 185 grams of strawberries or something like that. I mean, that's the most delicious thing you could possibly have at the end of one of those meals. Yeah, exactly. So the, the thing that kind of, uh, the one thing that I wanted to bring up is like with that, when you are starting something new, something that's really, really important is getting that escape velocity. And what I generally recommend is like a, a temporary, right? I'm raving the, the, the flags here, temporary, highly increased effort for it creating that escape velocity. Because what that's going to do is like get you quick wins and get momentum moving, right? And for a lot of people, like using the example you just, you, you gave with walking that same meal, like you know, the, 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 the levels it goes through is like you chop the low hanging fruit. The problem is after you chop the low hanging fruit, when you need to chop the next layer of fruit, it's not as quite low hanging as the first layer was. And you got to keep chopping like higher and higher. Um, and kind of like what, what you're saying was like, as you near in proximity to that goal, your margins get smaller, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. And that requires a higher, more detailed effort to further continue to produce those adaptations that you're after. And so many people do not, you know, they, they, they don't understand it or maybe their coach doesn't explain that to them well, well enough. But then it's after, after like achievement, you can start layering that flexibility back in. And that's when the pendulum starts swinging back to like, you know, our quote unquote left side. And then you can find that balance, but it never swings. Like when you watch a pendulum swing, the first time it swings, as it comes back that second time, it never goes as far in either direction as it did on that like first swing. And then over enough passes back and forth, you settle into that middle. And like that is like, I, I feel like just a, such a fascinating um, like metaphoric representation of like dieting and then getting to a body composition you want, getting more flexible with your lifestyle again in the quote unquote off season. But like you, Brian, like you're like, when, when you first were starting, I remember, I remember we were like two, what, 205, 210 pounds back in the day. Yeah. Like you're, you're never going to be that weight again, probably. No. You know uh, what I mean? Like yeah. the, the amount, like, like you've, we, we started the episode with you talking about everything you've been eating over the past five weeks and you're still 15 to 20 pounds from like old school Brian. Isn't that wild, man? Because like in those CrossFit days, we were working out so much that for me to get to 205 or 210, I must have been eating just an absurd amount of food. That, and I think too, it is um, not to totally derail the episode, but just the, the high cortisol high very very high stress environment what that does with with uh sex Mm -hmm. hormones over time and we know like what i mean i do not want to go down this rabbit hole but the hormones impact the calories out part of the Mm -hmm. equation Mm -hmm. so when like endocrine system is humming and things are really really good your calories out is higher when things are not in a great state that's just lower and that small part of the equation but i think that was a big Part of it. I mean, we were, I, I mean, I know personally, I was just living in an incredibly stress, like prone I- I environment. My sleep was garbage, um, very low carbohydrate, right? A very high glycolytic activity, tons of alcohol. It's, it's a breeding ground for high stress <laughs> environment, yeah. you know what I mean? But yeah, for sure. um, it's one of those things like that the longer you play it, right, the more iterations you go through that pendulum doesn't swing as far and you get better at it. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like understanding that it's not that you never drink alcohol again or you don't have pizza and stuff like that, but it's just the periodization really is like the key to it. But so many people get stuck never making it through like the first season of periodization one to reap all the benefits that come on the back end of that. And what that takes is a higher acute temporary effort to get through that first periodization. And it might mean pulling alcohol for like three months or something mm-hmm. like that. I like to think of it as like a challenge sort of thing. Like that's what mine started as. You would have told 2014, 2015, <laughs> you know, uh, 2014, 2015, Aaron, that we wouldn't be drinking alcohol anymore. Like you would have never believed it, but like here we are yeah. sort of thing. Um, 
and that's like a really really good way to to approach it um and sharing that with you the people around you sort of thing it's like a temporary challenge sort of thing and then layering back into flexibility yeah i love the way that you phrase that with metaphorical representation for for the pendulum um because that's that's exactly what it is so so i know we need to wrap up here in a second but uh, uh, my question for you is with this idea of finding balance, how often do you generally have clients spend practicing maintenance, which would be, you know, the prototypical balance? And then do you find that that number of practicing maintenance increases or decreases with a client's, call it training age, but you could just call it like uh, optimal lifestyle age or something along those lines? Yeah, so I st- everyone starts at maintenance essentially and the reason is twofold. We need to actually identify what that maintenance really is from a caloric standpoint because we know it's a it's a moving target and it's going to be different for every person. But the real reason is it's skill acquisition. It is a period of skill acquisition. The the hard and fast truth that is that 95% of clients that want to sign up and diet do not have the skills and understandings yet to successfully execute a diet without blowing it. And I mean, without, or what I, I should say blowing it, like crashing and burning, trying. Yeah. Because they're, they're, they're on the extremes, because they're on one extreme or the other extreme and they can't find <clears throat> that balance. So, so that totally makes sense. But with that idea, like if the goal ultimately is to become better at balance in your life, kind of like this is the higher overarching goal, like, hey, I found balance, you know, I'm never going to be 210 again. And I'm obviously never going to be 160 or something like that. But, but I've found my balance, you know, uh, but yet given the way that we know that with training age or with optimal lifestyle age, you have to become more dialed in over time. It seems like despite the fact that balance is the goal, you're still going to have to veer off of balance slightly. So that pendulum has to go like 5% one way and 5% back the other way. Like it's never stable directly in the middle the higher your training age or optimal lifestyle age is, you have to continue to kind of push the boundaries a little bit on either side. Yeah, and I think what I'm finding most with my clients now is people want, they're like, okay, I'm I'm happy. I, I got pretty lean. I, I'm pretty happy with it. I want to go through like a gaining period now. And now it's like they the like the end of the diet or which would be like the end of the reverse diet, the recovery diet and the start of the, the gaining period kind of like we start blending that and it just becomes like this very slow moving wave over the year where they're like, okay, I'm up however much weight over like the winter summer's coming. I, I'm, I'm happy with the gains I've made. I want to lean out again. So it's not so much like we're back at maintenance for like four months because people like to have goals, mm-hmm. you know, and, and the goal of staying the same is like really kind of subjective. <laughs> and since, since, Maintenance is a moving target, like just slowly adding calories is generally a, a good idea so you can find what that upper threshold is before your weight average actually really starts moving. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's what I find that like mo- most of my clients are, are asking about, not so much like, yeah, okay, I want to go back to maintenance. Like, no, I want to put on some muscle now. Sort of. Yeah, so maybe a way of of putting it into perspective for the listener would be that like, if maintenance is directly in the middle of that pendulum where the the needle isn't moving at all, maybe the real balance that we're trying to search for is balance within the extremes. So if you have the extreme that goes in the deficit extreme where there's like the, the one way of doing it with Tetris and extreme dieting and extreme food elimination, et cetera. And then on the other side, it's like you're almost at maintenance. So, you know... You're barely losing weight at all. There's there's a balance in the middle where you can just you become better at dieting, like the process of dieting, and it doesn't feel so extreme. The pendulum doesn't oscillate during your diet where you're like, oh, I had a cheat day. Oh, I'm really in the deficit now. I have to like compensate for the cheat day. You know, the pendulum doesn't move so far on that side. It just kind of oscillates a little bit, but it's still off middle. And then same alternatively on the other side, it's like instead of going and eating 7,000 calories one day and then being sick and throwing all of it up, that would be like a super extreme example, but that would be like your pendulum on the, on the, on the gaining side. Uh, maybe it just stays a little bit 
shifted to the side of maintenance but on the side of like just eating a little bit more calories than that so so that balance exists within the extremes exactly and then the, my kind of closing thoughts and statement will be with the periodizations you can take advantage of that side of the pendulum so like obviously a gaining period is going to lend itself much more towards like the hedonistic side of mm-hmm. the pendulum because we need to eat more anyway in a lot of these hyper palatable foods or your restaurant meals, your date nights, your friends' meals, they're just, it's inherently higher in calories. That's the way it works. Works great for when you are eating more and then periods when you are not just steering some of those social, you know, um, gatherings, I should say, to friendlier types of things for that current periodization or pulling back, having periods without alcohol or drastically reducing what that may be in pursuit of the goal, but understanding that there's both and that you can leverage those, you know, that perpetual swinging of the pendulum to your advantage when you just understand how to play the game a little bit better. Yep. Super well said. Cool. Anything else on this one, Brian? No, man, that's good. I think next week we should definitely delve into some of that uh, data-driven podcast on on muscle lengths with Milo Wolf because it's a good one on the heels of kind of our conversation with Cass. So we'll give everyone a chance to listen to the Cass episode and then um, address that. Yeah, we will. I saw a brief thing about it uh, on Instagram, so I'm going to go back and find that and, and, and slot up that, that episode to listen to for sure. Very cool. As always always guys thank you for listening if this episode was valuable or helpful for uh you guys in any way um please let brian and i know you can obviously tag us in anything on social media we always appreciate that as well as always thank you for listening we will talk to you next week